Thank you so much for taking time to listen to today's message. We really hope it encourages you. And if you want to listen to more, check us out at faithfellowshipchurch.net. But for now, let's jump into today's message. Um, Acts chapter 16, I want to kind of catch you up where we have been for the last several weeks. Uh, you, can, you can watch our sermons online if you haven't been with us for the past several weeks. Uh, we're on YouTube, we're on faithfellowshipchurch.net. Um, because I'm still kind of continuing a series of watching and following the journey with Paul and Timothy and what it is to disciple, what it looks like to disciple somebody effectively. Paul meets a young man named Timothy in Acts chapter 16. Paul is traveling north of Jerusalem. He ends up in a city called Lystra. And when he gets to Lystra, so impressed with a young disciple. I like that it terms that way in my Bible in Acts chapter 16, a young disciple named Timothy. It says that Timothy's dad was a Greek. His mom was a Jewish believer. And Paul was so impressed again that he said, Timothy, I want you to join me on a journey. We're on a missions journey. Myself, Silas, and our companions, would you join us on the journey? And I want you to imagine what that conversation was like. Did Timothy immediately just say, yes. Did he say, let me talk to my parents about it. Let me say, did he say, just let me pray. Did he say like immediately, I I feel in my heart, like, yes, I'm supposed to do this. What was that like? And somewhere in that place, Timothy responded with an absolute yes. As they leave on their missions journey, some things that we've touched on before, but I think just for for perspective's sake, they left Lystra, they began their journey, and as they go, Timothy is clearly being discipled and understanding what it means to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. He sees Paul cast a demon out of a young girl. In that moment after that, Paul and Silas are arrested and thrown in prison. Timothy is being discipled in some really unique ways. It's kind of like hands-on training for Timothy. Paul and Silas are in prison. The prison guard gets saved. And Timothy is witnessing all of this in Acts chapter 16 and 17. And finally in Acts chapter 19, they arrive in a city named Ephesus. And they get there. And there's 12 believers that they meet on the coast. And Paul prays with these 12 believers. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in tongues. And after that, he goes into the city of Ephesus. And he begins to preach for a couple of months. But he increases some some opposition in the city. And so he begins to speak at a public forum for two years. Paul continues to preach in the city of Ephesus. And we touched on Ephesus last week as being the city that was known for the goddess Artemis, who was the goddess of fertility, the Greek goddess of fertility. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the temple of Artemis. For over two years, they are there. And here's what I want you to try to paint in your, in your mind for about three years. Paul is with Timothy. If you've read any of Paul's writings, I'm sure that Paul and Timothy are having discussions, maybe late night sitting by a fire, maybe having dinner, you know, praying for somebody after service. What was that like? Talking about grace, understanding the prophecies in the Old Testament, understanding more about Messiah. And for probably this three-year time period, Paul has been mentoring and discipling Timothy. And they are in Ephesus now. And as Timothy is continuing to see demons cast out of people and people healed as, as even handkerchiefs that Paul touched would be laid on the sick. And it says that they were instantly healed. Timothy is witnessing all of this as a disciple and as a disciple maker being Paul. There is a beautiful relationship here. And there is a lot of growth taking place in both of them. At one point, there is a riot in the city of Ephesus led and instigated by a man named Demetrius, who was a silversmith. And we touched on him last week. Demetrius was realizing that Paul's influence and the influence of the gospel was taking away from their livelihood. This riot ensued. Finally, the governor was called into place. And the governor said, these guys have done nothing wrong, nothing illegal. They should be set free. In chapter 20 of Acts, in verse 1, It says that Paul gets together with the believers and he encourages them. And I'm sure that he prayed with them in the conversation. And then it says he left for Macedonia and it tells us nothing about Timothy. However, first Timothy chapter one tells us what happened. I like this about the Bible. When you begin to read the Bible and you begin to read the all of it, you see how connected it really is. And that's what I love about the story of Paul and Timothy, because it's a very connected story. When you read the book of Ephesians, when you read the book of Acts, chapter 16 through 20, and when you read the books of first and second Timothy, all of that together is one story. And it paints a very vivid story of their relationship and of what discipleship looked like between these two men. Chapter one of first Timothy verses three to five. And I'm reading out of the Passion Translation this morning. It is what is on the U version app. Paul says this, as I urged you when I left for Macedonia. When did he leave for Macedonia? In Acts chapter 20, right after a riot 
had ensued in this city. When I urged you, or as I urged you when I left for Macedonia, I'm asking that you remain in Ephesus to instruct them not to teach or follow the error of deceptive doctrines, nor to pay any attention to cultural myths, traditions, or the endless study of genealogies. These digressions only breed controversies and debates. They are devoid of power that builds up and strengthens the church and the faith of God. For we reach the goal of fulfilling all of the commandments when we love each other deeply with a pure heart and a clean conscience and a sincere faith. I wonder what that conversation was like prior to the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. For about three years, he had been discipling with him. Timothy had seen Paul and Silas go to prison. He had seen them being beat. He had seen miracles. He had seen demons cast out of people. He had seen handkerchiefs that Paul touched just being laid on people and they were healed. And now about three years into their relationship, and Timothy is a young man. Timothy is more than likely, most theologians believe, in about his, his 20s, late 20s, early 30s. A young man that he said, you know what, I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to leave my, my dad, who isn't a believer, my mom, who is a believer. And I'm going to follow this man, and I have no idea where we're going. And I'm committing to this. And after about three years of an incredible adventure of being discipled and following the Lord, Paul sits down with him after a riot. And he says, Timothy... It has been an amazing journey. I have no idea what the conversation was like. But at some point, and he loved Timothy deeply. At some point, he said, Timothy, I need to go on from here. But I believe that you need to stay here in the city of Ephesus where a riot just happened. And you need to pastor these people. Are you good for this? What do you think that conversation was like? Do you think it was, do you think there were tears that were shed? Do you think that it was like excitement? Do you think it was confusion? Do you think Timothy was like... I need to pray about this, Paul. There was a riot and you want to leave me here alone? I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have what this takes to pastor these people. I'm a young man. And somewhere along the way, we know that Timothy agreed. As Paul left and as you read the words in First and Second Timothy, you see that Paul grieved and says that he shed tears and they cried when they said goodbye in Ephesus and Paul went on to Macedonia. And what was that like? Was Timothy waiting at the end of the street and Paul is leaving and maybe they're waving goodbye until they can't see each other anymore? And Timothy's like, here it is. I'm a pastor now in a city where there was just a riot. I'm a pastor now in the city of Ephesus that, that uh, uh, idolizes uh, uh, the goddess Artemis, the goddess of fertility. I'm in a city that deals with culturally uh, different things than the gospel. And Paul writes him a letter. And in the very first words, he says, Timothy, I remember that day when I urged you in Mas in, when I was going to Macedonia. And I said, stay here and pastor these people. And he said, he talks about, do you see this? He talks about um, culture. He says, he says, don't pay attention to cultural myths or traditions. He's, he's speaking to some of the things in the culture of that city. And he's reminding Timothy of that day. And I want to look at the reminding that takes place in this letter. He reminds Timothy of that moment. And I'm sure in that moment, as Timothy finally gets this letter, he is remembering the moment that he is sitting down with his mentor, with the man that has discipled him. And he is remembering the emotion of the moment and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, yes, I'm supposed to do this. I'm going to pastor these people as a young man. Paul goes on and he looks at this. And I want you to look at 1 Timothy verse, chapter, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. He says, so Timothy, my son, I am entrusting you with this responsibility. In keeping with the very first prophecies that were spoken over your life and are now in the process of fulfillment in this great work of ministry. In keeping with the prophecies spoken over you, with this encouragement, use your prophecies as weapons as you wade spiritual warfare by faith and with a clean conscience. For there are many who reject these virtues and are now destitute of their faith. He says, Timothy, I'm entrusting you to this responsibility. Chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. He's saying, I'm, I've left you in Ephesus. I'm entrusting you with this responsibility. And I am reminding you of the prophecy spoken over your life. What prophecy? We don't know. But Timothy knows. And I love that. He's saying, Timothy, do you remember the prophecy spoken over your life? Do you remember the word spoken over your life, Timothy? He reminds him later on, we're going to look at it in just a little bit. He says, Timothy, do you remember the time that I laid hands on you and you received a spiritual gift from God and then I prophesied over your life? And then he tells Timothy, I want you to fan into flame the gift that God sent to you that day. He's reminding Timothy of things. And Timothy, in this moment, as he's reading these words, he's, he's remembering, remembering when God spoke to him. 
How many of you have, have, if you think back right now, and it might come back vividly or it might come back faintly, but you can remember a word that God spoke over your life. You can remember a moment that God spoke over your life. It may have been a, a, an encounter. It may have been a moment. It may have been a, a, a fan in a chair in Mexico. It may have been a, a crazy word that God spoke to you that nobody else would understand. It may have been a personal word about your past. It may have been a word of freedom. It may have been, I don't know what the word was, but I want you to think right now, can you remember a word that God spoke to you somewhere along your life? Has it grown faint? Because I love Paul's words with Timothy. He is now, he has, he's spent like about three years with him, discipling this man, pouring into this man, experiencing life and teaching him the word. And now he's getting to the place where he is leaving him and now he is writing him letters and he's saying, Timothy, remember, do you remember this? Do you remember these moments? Do you remember the prophecies? Do you remember when we spent time together? As they continue to go on, I want you to look real quickly at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21 with me. He says, so my son Timothy, don't forget. In other words, remember. The book is full of remembrances. This letter is full of things to remind him. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. So my son Timothy, don't forget all that has been deposited within you escape from the empty echoes of men and the perversion of twisted reasoning for those who claim to possess the so-called knowledge have already wandered from the true faith. May God's grace empower you always love in Christ, Paul. I love those last few words. I love these last few words. He says, those who claim to possess the so-called knowledge have wandered away from true faith. I think sometimes Corinthians says it so clearly. He says that talks about the wisdom of God is foolish to this world, right? It says that God confounds the wise with his foolish thinking. The gospel makes no sense logically when you begin to think about it. And I think sometimes as, as, as Christians, as believers, and when we are pursuing the call of God in our life, God might ask you to do something that makes no sense at all. And sometimes we might try to rely on knowledge and on wisdom. And yet the Bible really um, embraces uh, faith and, and that risk sometimes of trusting God more than it does human knowledge and human wisdom. Amen. Now, absolutely, God values wisdom and knowledge, so don't misunderstand me. But truly, 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 there's that place where sometimes we might, we might lose hold of what God is calling us to and what God has spoken us to because of wisdom and knowledge getting in the way. And when we allow wisdom and knowledge to get in the way, I won't be able to support my family if I do what God told me to do. I won't be able to, to accomplish whatever. I won't have whatever if I follow the call of God in my life. And he's saying, Timothy, don't forget don't forget. I wonder if, if they had phones back then, obviously they didn't, but imagine Timothy was from Lystra and he's in Ephesus now. I wonder what it was like when Timothy maybe went home. We don't really know if he ever did. If he ever went back, if he wrote a letter to his parents, his mom and his dad, his dad, not a believer, his mom is a believer. What if he was like on the phone one day calling to say what he's going to do the rest of his life as he's been gone now and his family just watched him leave. I wonder if it was like, hey, mom, it's, it's, it's good to hear your voice. Yeah, no, things are, well, things are, things are going. Well, we kind of got kicked out of Philippi. Well, uh, spent a night in jail. No, 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 it's good. It's okay. That, really, we're fine. Yeah, I'm still with that guy named Paul. Well, after that, well, trouble in Thessalonica too. Uh, another day in jail. Did you know what's crazy? Uh, he cast a demon out of somebody. Yes, a demon. No, no, no. I, I, tell dad everything is really okay. Well, so I have to tell you something. You see, Paul, that guy that I left with, he wants me to, he wants me to stay in Ephesus. Yeah, I know, Ephesus. He wants me to pastor these people. And, and he's leaving me. No, no, I, I think I'll be okay. I know this might sound crazy to you, but this is what I believe God wants me to do. And Paul is leaving me here now. Can you imagine? And maybe you can imagine because maybe that's been your life. When God speaks to you something that sounds crazy to the wisdom of the world, but you know that you know that you know that you know that God has spoken something in your heart. And we need to hold on to those moments because Timothy, I, I love when people say the Bible, I can't relate to. You begin to look at these stories. This is incredibly relatable to me. He's living in a family where his dad doesn't believe in God and his mom does. I'm sure that was interesting family dynamics. 
He's living as a family as a young man in his 20s where he has a, a, a guy show up and say, hey, I want you to follow the call of God in your life. And Timothy passionately does that where people probably misunderstood him a little bit. And now he is trying to figure this out. Timothy stayed in Ephesus as a pastor. He pastored that church. And eventually, Paul wrote him a second letter. Now, you know what I love about the Bible? I love these letters of Timothy. And I think this is really good. I went back to go look at my facts this morning because I want to give you some information that I think is really, really good. I, I love this. When I read my Bible, it's like, well, you know what? How do I even know that this is what Paul wrote to Timothy? How do we even know that this is accurate stuff, right? Then that, that is a good thing to know. Can I really trust the Bible? Is it accurate? I'm looking at these words thinking, well, how do I know that Paul wrote this? I think this is really good. The way that historians authenticate literature of pieces of literature that were before the, the printing press, which was invented in, in Gutenberg, Germany in the 1500s. And the first book printed was the Bible. First book ever printed was the Bible in Gutenberg, Germany. But before the 1500s, before the printing press, everything was handwritten manuscripts. So if somebody wrote something and if you wanted to read a manuscript, a, a book, a piece of literature, you would have to read a handwritten copy. Which of course you could tell that was a, a process, right? When we look at the works of, of Plato, if you've ever studied Plato, the philosopher, how do we know what Plato really said when people say Plato said this work? Well, what they have done, historians have found pieces of literature that Plato wrote, and it looks similar to his writing style, and historians will lay them side by side, all these different pieces of literature, and say, you know what, this looks all the same, it's similar as, as far as his writing style, it, it's, it's speaking that it is of Plato, and maybe if, if one piece of literature, uh, uh, one of these copies, maybe like copy number six out of out of seven is maybe missing a paragraph, then the historians might say, well, you know what? If six out of seven have all of these paragraphs, but one is missing it, maybe the scribe missed that one. But more than likely, this is all of what Plato said. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? This is what I think is amazing to do. You should go, go prove this yourself. Don't just believe me because I'm telling you this. I know I always say that, but this is, this is fascinating to me. How can I believe that the Bible is authentic? Aside from faith, aside from the Holy Spirit, Plato's works, there have been 210 copies of Plato's works found. Manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts. That's a lot, right? 210 is a decent amount of manuscripts found of one man's works to say, this is probably what Plato wrote. So I would probably say if there are 210 manuscripts of one man's work found, I know we're kind of sidestepping for just a second. Just go with me here for a minute. 210 copies of Plato's works found then people believe that's what Plato said. And people don't doubt that. People teach Plato, they study Plato, and they said, this is what this man said. You look at Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. 1,757 copies found of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. That's a lot, right? 1,000? 1,700? That's a lot. The New Testament, over 25,000. Over 25, grasp that, over 25 thousand handwritten manuscript copies of the new testament and and the second most authenticated piece of literature in history is homer's Iliad and the odyssey with one thousand and then you have twenty five thousand so when historians look at literature and they say is this accurate is this really what paul wrote timothy historians will lay it out and they will tell you the new testament is the most authenticated piece of literature in history by far so so when we say, did Paul write these words to Timothy? And is this accurate stuff what we read? I would say undoubtedly historians, aside from faith and aside from the Holy Spirit, will tell you yes. So to look at Paul's words, I think what we can say is this is more than likely what Paul wrote to Timothy. And in his first letter and in his second letter, he is saying, Timothy, I want you to remember the moment that we said goodbye. I want you to remember the prophecy spoken over your life. I want you to remember. And in 2 Timothy, he says this. I'm going to wrap it up with these words. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God that I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Verse 4, I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. Can you imagine that moment? Three years he'd probably been with this guy. And now he's having to say, I want you to pastor this church in Ephesus. And Paul's like, I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that that same faith continues strong in you. That is why I remind you 
to fan into flame the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a self-discipline. Over and over and over, Paul is saying, Timothy, I want you to remember. I want you to remember. Timothy stayed as a pastor in the church of Ephesus until he died. He gave his life for that church. And I believe a huge part of that is looking back on the moment when he sat with Paul in Ephesus. And at one point when Paul laid his hands on him and said, Timothy, I I know the gift of God is on your life. I know the calling of God is on your life. Would you follow me on this journey? I want to disciple you. I want to mentor you. Timothy, I believe in you. Timothy, you're going to be a pastor one day over these people. And he's reminding him and he's writing him a letter saying, remember, remember, remember. And twice he says, remember the prophecy spoken over your life. Church, I believe this, that that for some of you this morning, I do believe this, that there are words that have been spoken over some of you throughout your life. And you need to remember those words from God. I do believe this, that when God speaks, his voice never fades. I believe that because God is eternal. His word will always eternally echo in your heart. I really believe that. I thoroughly do. God's word never returns void. His word is eternal. His word is alive and active. That's why it is still echoing the chambers of your heart. And I believe that some of you have had a call of God in your life somewhere along the way, and it still echoes and bounces around, and you need to remember that. Because sometimes the wisdom of the world gets in the way. And sometimes we say, you know what, God, I know that that's what you said to do. I know that's what burned in my heart. I know that is what still burns in my heart. But, and I would say this this morning, remember. Remember what God spoke to you. Remember what he said. Fan into flame. Remember. I think this too, we need to remember the God, the word that God speaks over us. And I think too that God's voice, more than any other voice, is truer. I think sometimes our emotions get in the way. And we begin to hear things and we, we hear our own voice or we hear the voice of maybe our, our people around us that we appreciate and that love us, but maybe sometimes might, might say things because out of their love might not be what's best for us as far as the call of God. And they might think, well, might, that's kind of scary. That's kind of risky. Maybe you shouldn't do that. And I think sometimes we need to not hear our voice and hear the voice of God because God's voice is truer. God knows best. I want to do this this morning. It's just simply this. I'm going to have you come play, Billy, if you would. I want you just to do this with me. If you would just close your eyes and just to focus on Jesus. My message was simple. It was short this morning. Numerous times as I was praying this week, it was the simplicity reading through the stories of Timothy. And I just kept saying the word remember and remind. And I was like, that's it. That's what I believe that God wants to speak this morning. Some of you need to remember the call of God in your life. Some of you need to remember the word that God spoke to you. And this morning, I would say this. Remember. But don't just remember, but to act on it, to do something with it. Timothy, I have to believe, lived an incredibly satisfying life because he was doing what he was created for. We are created truly for the glory of God. God designed us on purpose and for purpose. And if there, if if it's, I know that there's people in here this morning, I just know it in my heart. There's, There's people in here this morning that God spoke something to you a long time ago, a call on your life. And that other things have gotten in the way from truly fulfilling that call. If that's you this morning, I'm going to have the prayer team and the elders just make their way up front in the middle of this kids' vacation Bible school, beautiful mess. So I'm going to have the prayer team and the elders come up. We want to pray with you this morning. And I believe that it is important for us to pray this morning with you. I really do. As Paul prayed for Timothy, as we prayed for one another this morning, I think there is absolutely, as Jesus said, we're two or more gathered together in my name. And I'm there with them. I think there's power in unity and power in having someone pray with you and for you. 
If there is someone here, if there's you're here this morning and you know, it's like, Pastor Eric, yeah, I know that God called me. I remember that word. I remember those prophecies. I remember that. It says that God's gifts and callings are irrevocable and it will still haunt you in a really good way because God's purpose never changes. So if that's you in any way, we want to pray with you this morning. And I want to pray this way, that there would be a place where you would step into the call of God in your life. If you have felt like there is a call of God and I'm kind of sidestepped it or life has gotten in the way, but I know that it is still there and you remember that, then I just want you to make your way up. We want to pray with you this morning. And just get out of your seat. Just make your way up. Just do it. If that's where you're at, if that's you, let us pray with you. Let us pray with you. I, just, I genuinely believe there's something to this. And church, for the rest of you, I just want you to pray real quickly, all right? Just begin to pray for people this morning. God, I thank you that you are a God of purpose. God, that you purposely sent Paul to Timothy. God, that you purposely sent that man to disciple that young man. God, that you purposely have sent us, as Brian reminded me this morning. God, that we are doing what you call us to do this week in our church. Going into all the world, making disciples of all nations. That's what you have called us to do, to be disciple makers. So Jesus, in our homes, in our businesses, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our church, let us disciple one another effectively. All for the glory of Jesus. All to honor you, Lord God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the words that you have spoken over us in the past. Thank you for the words today. And thank you, God, that you will continue to carry us in the future. In Jesus' great name, amen. Amen. If you would like someone to pray with you for any reason, we're here to pray for you. Please just come up and we just want to pray.